I'm delighted to welcome the Secretary of State for Defence, Ben Wallace, uh, to uh, join me in a conversation as part of our, of our conference today. Uh, Mr Wallace has uh, given a, a big speech this morning at the Army, uh, National Army Museum and uh, has raised some of the issues that we've been talking about this morning. Um, I been thinking about how, how, one might, uh, how one might start with this. Um, as many people have, have, have said, it's the 9th of May, Russian Victory Day. Um, Vladimir Putin's spoken, you've spoken. Uh, he's accused the West of preparing an invasion uh, of, of, of Russian land, NATO being a threat. And you selected this day to, uh, to make a keynote speech on the Ukrainian conflict. Um, you're a former soldier. Um, as you watch this conflict unfold, what are your thoughts about the course of the conflict and where we may go next? Well, I think, I mean, thanks. I mean, the, the reason I did the speech uh, was, despite how it appeared in some newspapers, it wasn't about necessarily Putin. It was really about um, the failure of the general staff of the Russian army to, to both, uh, I suppose, speak truth to power, but also to prepare their forces properly. Now, I, I had to be slightly careful because I didn't want to show any sympathy. I mean, I don't, you know, what the Russians are engaged in is an illegal invasion, and every soldier, whether they're junior or senior, has a responsibility in that. But, you know, from a professional point of view as a soldier, you, you have to marvel at the uh, sort of, you know, betrayal, really, of many of those people. And many of those people who are not all in support of the war will get no voice. Um, and it's quite important if you're ever going to try and penetrate the Russian system to make the point that suffering does not excuse culpability. Um, today will be a, a whole exercise in the Russian... I mean, remember, it is the Soviet, effectively, uh, Union uh, who fought the Second World War, not the Russians uh, alone. Um, and, um, you know, I think Ukraine market the day before, but nevertheless, it, is, it, is, it, is a, it was a collective en uh, endeavour. Um, but you won't hear any culpability in any of it. You won't, no one ever asks uh, whether suffering uh, oh. is um, actually a sign of failure at high levels. And so uh, the purpose of the speech was to make sure that President Putin doesn't wrap it all up, uh, put the cloak of this great uh, you know, defeat of Nazism around himself and use it for his own imperial ambitions, which is exactly what he has been doing. And I think that is uh, very important to challenge that assertion. Um, and, uh, you know, if you read his essay he wrote 2020, it's another piece of amazing fiction that he positioned himself as the saviour, well, Russia, or the Soviet Union as the saviour of the world. And actually, we all know it was much more complicated. He plays down the Ribbentrop Pact, which effectively allowed the Russians to dismember Poland, uh, transport people from the Baltics, um, and that's all forgotten. And, uh, you know, no one ever, he never registers that Britain really stood alone for pretty much two years before they turned up. So um, I think... It's just important to register that today there are lots of people dying, suffering unnecessarily, strategically because of the illegal invasion, and then tactically because of, you know, utter incompetence in the Russian general staff. Now, I don't want them to be successful, so don't please make that mistake. But, um, and, you know, you have to, and that's why the Army Museum is important, to, to remind people that the people who pay the price of imperialist ambitions or... Uh, uh, rewriting history or indeed general staff who like to have lovely parades but don't actually deliver the effect on the ground is, is the young soldier and uh, that's where we're get to now and you know even worse than that it's the people that are their targets which is Ukraine. Obviously we're holding this uh, conference um, at King's College in a university and you, the audience are going to hear from our student panel uh, at the end of the day who are, who are providing the conclusions and hopefully a uh, uh, a, a summary of the day. Um, so I asked the students if they would uh, give me some questions for you as well, and they've been quite forthright. Uh, and on this question, um, they, they were saying, were you intending to wind up the Russians with the, with the speech? And, and, and you know, are you hoping to achieve something specific? I mean, they've read it, and, 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 and they thought uh, that, it, that it was a challenging speech. But I, th I think if you ignore the sort of sub-ed written headlines in the newspapers and read the actual speech in full, um, I wasn't trying to wind up. I think I was trying to make the point that there is culpability in this. Uh, the culpability, you know, within the Russian system. You know, you, you, when I, uh, I remember going to St. Petersburg years ago and being told, you know, you don't understand more people died defending the city than the whole of you lost in the Second World War. Uh, and I remember saying slightly sheepishly from the back of a minibus at the time, I think, to a, the guide, 
So, as a soldier, I'm not sure a casualty rate is necessarily a sign of success. Um, uh, and when I went to Moscow about a week before the invasion, and Shoigu said to me, you know, no one suffers like us, as a sort of boast. And I'd said in the meeting that I don't want anyone to suffer. I, I remember saying, I've seen too many of my own soldiers buried to want people to do this. It was the stage where we were trying to persuade Russia to stop it. Um, and um, they were slightly thrown when I said, Look, I don't want Russians to suffer. I mean, it's not, it's not a, and the problem is it's been used to avoid culpability. And I think, you know, there are now body bags coming home in their tens of thousands potentially into Russia if they haven't been cremated or hidden. Um, there are therefore tens of thousands of injured Russians coming home. They can hide that, they can bully it, you know, uh, shame the widows into not speaking, which we saw when, when the curse went down. I don't remember, the lady was in fact injected by an agent in the middle of an audience. It's, you can see it live on YouTube when one of the wives of the Kursk actually says, well, where is it? And they inject her as she's, as she's complaining. So they can do all that. But I think it's important we point it out and make it very, very clear that, that huge amounts of what is going on is unnecessary. And the generals, you know, a good general would have told the truth to Putin by now. So you were security minister and a long-serving security minister at the time of the Salisbury uh, attack. Um, has that shaped your approach to Russia? I mean, you, you were one of the people who spoke out quite early about, about the challenge of Russia. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to deploy a nerve agent on a country's soil is a really big step. They, they won't have been taken freelance. That would have been, I think I remember said at the time, you know, authorised at the highest levels in the Russian government. You know, this is nerve agent, right? This is not a... <laughs> You know, this is uh, uh, not running someone over the car. It's a proper deployment of a military-capable chemical weapon when it was deployed on our streets. Uh, and uh, there was a bit of debate inside government about, um, you know, why were they so bad in doing it insofar as, you know, they all got caught, they appeared on Russia Today talking about cathedrals and actually started to look a bit comical but dangerous. Let, let's caveat that. And were they 10 foot tall or were, did they not care or... Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think at the time, and I'd been to visit Ukraine, I'd been to Ukraine five times, both as security minister and, and defence secretary. Uh, yeah, and you know what goes on. I know what they do uh, in many parts of the world. You've seen what Wagner's done in Libya. You've seen what they've done in Syria. And it, the world has not been paying attention to the nature of the regime. And I think we, we forget too much because we either look in our own backyard and only really care about that, or we... We remove the person, and in a, in a sort of effectively a totalitarian regime, the person's more important than anything else. And you can have all your analysis you like, but if there's someone who takes that view of the world, and as you can see in his own writings, he's convinced himself all sorts of things, you have to take that seriously, and you have to prepare for that, because you know, he, he, he is, he's got a view, he doesn't seem to want to change it, doesn't seem to listen to anything alternative, and um, it's a dangerous view. So we're going to have to live with Russia. Um, for the moment, we have to live with, with President Putin. Um, there have been references today already in this conference about whether or not we've returned to a new Cold War. Um, I'd be interested to know whether, whether, whether you find the, the analogy, even the, even the term, useful. Um, but no, you, no one can deny that there have been repeated references to nuclear weapons and to questions of, of escalation risk of escalation, little talk about the management of it, uh, to be frank. How, how, how far do we have any off-ramps in this crisis when, when, when the rhetoric at times seems to be going uh, in an extraordinarily worrying direction for the public? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I mean, there's one thing that's difficult to read, which is um, some of the tools we would usually relate to being less escalatory, like sanctions, so economic tools, actually in the Kremlin have the opposite effect. They're more escalatory in, in some of their minds because it's harder to hide from your public economic punishment. It's, it's much easier potentially to hide military casualties. They have a track record in being able to do that. In 2014 in the Donbass, there were lots of unmarked graves. And, you know, um, actually, fun enough, even the Great Patriotic War, one of the characteristics of, of, of the Soviet side at the time was they didn't ever really seek to find out what happened to many of those people. There were many, there were many, many families in the Soviet system who never knew what happened to their father and grandfather. It wasn't a, whereas we had a sense of trying to account for it. So, um, look, let's not forget the effort the world took to try and persuade Putin not to do this. 
you know, this was not like we didn't all try. We didn't all bend over backwards. You know, presidents, prime ministers, people went to the Kremlin. People still do, as we, as we see. You know, President Macron is often trying to engage with President Putin, asking him not to do it. It wasn't like he wasn't asked. Um, and uh, you know, I said to Shoigu that I said, look, you know, you don't understand that if you didn't do this, the world would relieve a really big sigh of relief. And he just said, well, we have no plans to invade Ukraine. I mean, it was a sort of, uh, you know, it was only about 10 days before. I mean, we weren't, I was born yesterday. So, I mean, I think, um, yeah, look, we are dealing with a difficult issue. Um, Cold War analogies, look, I'm sure someone out there is desperately trying to look for another phrase, a modern Iron Curtain phrase or Cold War. I think the key thing here is to ask NATO, which we did at my last Defence Minister's conference, is they need to set a long-term plan. You know, how are we, whatever happens in Ukraine, I think Putin will still be there, right? I mean, Putin, certainly in the short and middle time, I mean, he's 70 years of age, he's got plenty of time in a sense. So the question is, how do we contain Russia? How do we reassure our allies? And how do we provide resilience to other allies to make sure they are not a victim or subject to sub-thresholds, you know, lashings out or manipulation at the end of this uh, conflict or war? And I think that's the challenge we have to do. So we have to get the international sort of NATO membership to think long term. Now, whether that manifests itself in a Cold War, an Iron Curtain, or nothing like that, before anyone writes, Secretary of State Defense is calling for a new Iron Curtain, I'm not. Um, we need a plan. We need to see a plan across the whole of the international community uh, through NATO. Well, I'm going to come on to NATO in a minute, um, but you mentioned sanctions there. Um, what do you think needs to be done with the sanctions tool to make it a more effective, coercive uh, um, part of your armory, in, in effect? It doesn't seem to be achieving the ends we want yet. I, I know the Americans have talked about uh, like a 12-week, 16-week time frame or whatever, but you know, can, can we make the sanctions more effective? Uh, well, I mean, I, you know, Britain's been quite vocal and wanting to be harsher on the gas uh, sanctions. Uh, I wouldn't underplay, however, that when eventually that does happen in a broader <coughs> sense, that that won't have an effect. You know, Russia is fighting the war in Ukraine with 65 to 75 percent of its land forces. They will have to be refurbished. They will have to be re-equipped. Uh, that won't be able to be done. You know, the time they get round to trying to do that, I suspect the sanctions will be much harsher anyhow. Uh, they're already, they haven't, I think there are a number of consequences of sanctions that haven't yet been felt, but will be. Um, you know, photographs of people at cafes in Moscow is not actually a benchmark of whether sanctions are working. You know, look at the ruble, look at its long-term, you know, challenges when it has to both get, uh, you know, um, knowledge, you know, people, services, and technologies, you know, huge amounts of what's been exposed here is a large part of their military capability is based on Western technologies or components. Well, that's not going to happen. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, we've been more vocal at gas, and we have to effectively be tougher on that. Britain has uh, tried to move that further. Uh, I think we'll get there. It's oil, I think, is the latest one they're talking about. Um, but in many other areas, they're already finding it difficult. Um, but they, we knew they built up reserves. I mean, he's got lots of reserves, um, which he will try. Um, but, you know, he cannot miss the fact that the Western international community, plus Australia and others, are actually quite unified. I mean, in, in a converse way, um, if, if things moved towards negotiations of some sort, which might involve um, parties other than the Ukrainians and, and, and the Russians, uh, do you think there would be uh, a withdrawal? And this, this comes from the students, by the way. Uh, do you think there would be a withdrawal of sanctions relatively quickly, potentially? Or are we essentially looking at a posture towards a Russia that has done something unacceptable? Well, certainly the characteristic of most of these sanctions are punitive rather than deterrent. I mean, uh, uh, and I think, to be fair, the Ukrainians were often asking for sanctions earlier as a deterrent rather than punitive. And, you know, that, that, that you'd, you'd, you'd hear a number of the international community saying, well, he hasn't done it yet. So, so that being punitive, they have to be punitive, let, let, let's be honest, um, for, for, for what he has done or what the regime has done. Um, look, I, I think it is, and we have to be very careful here, uh, it is for Ukraine to choose its future and where it wants to settle or not settle or go with this uh, conflict. And I think, you know, it would be quite wrong for me to sit here and 
either put conditions on Ukraine or tell Ukraine what peace it has to make. That is for Ukraine. The thing worth fighting for, for all of us, is the freedom to choose of a sovereign nation. What it chooses with that choice, you know, with that freedom, is entirely up to that. It's the same as Finland and Sweden, you know. Uh, President Putin would love it, because it would fit with his narrative, that NATO is there trying to seduce Finland or Sweden or is encouraging them to join. Uh, uh, we're not, actually. We would absolutely understand and recognise the importance of the freedom to choose. But Sweden and Finland will be very close allies of the United Kingdom, whether they choose NATO or not. Right? It, 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 you know, we're, we have a squadron of British tanks in Finland right now, I think the first time ever. Um, so, but, but my God, I would stand up and defend their right to choose. And if you listen to the President of Finland's speech at New Year, it was a very good speech about that. So, so I think um, you know, I'm not going to start putting stipulations on Ukraine. That is for Ukraine. I do, of course, want to help them negotiate from a position of strength, not weakness. That's why we're standing by and will continue as long as they wish us to do so. Well, you're, you're teasing me with, uh, with NATO. So um, the NATO summit's coming up next month. The Sherpas will be out there. They'll be already drafting the, uh, the, the communiques, which, which will say stolid things. How resilient do you feel at this stage the NATO alliance is as we face potentially an, a summer, a continuation of this conflict well into the autumn? So, I mean, I think NATO has worked actually incredibly well. Um, you know, contrary to the allegation that it was brain dead, it's actually the opposite. So, look, you know, it, it, it's harsh, but it's true. You know, Ukraine is not in NATO, um, and we, I've been open about that for, for, for months and weeks. And you know, for years, a number of nations wanted to move at different speeds, but it, it isn't. But within NATO's borders, NATO has very quickly stepped up in military support around those borders. You know, for example, we've got a company in Bulgaria, we've got six Typhoon aircraft in Romania, we've got two battle groups at the moment in Estonia, we've got a good few hundred troops, Royal Engineers and infantry in, and light cavalry in Poland, we've got, uh, you know, ships deployments, etc. So, so, and, and we're not alone, and there's a huge amount. I think there's 100,000 United States troops in Europe at the moment. Um, so NATO has responded. Um, it's remained consistent. We didn't cancel cold response up in the high north. We, 35,000 troops, including actually troops attached from Finland and Sweden. Uh, and actually, we have come together very well. Um, and we, yes, some countries move at different paces, but there are 30 members. But we've all got there. Uh, so I think it's worked well. I think the next challenge for it is long term. What are we going to do with this Russia as it is? How are we going to provide that resilience and you know, uh, a containment and, and reinforcement or, or whatever we have to do? But, but fundamentally, uh, I think it has worked very well. Well, on that looking forward point, what does success look like for NATO? I mean, forgive me for putting Ukraine to one side here, because the, the, the challenges that this, this, this invasion, this crisis has thrown up some people talk about it being existential for a number of, of entities in, in Europe. You know, what does NATO need to come out of this stronger rather than weaker? Well, I think it needs to have shown that deterrence, it can deliver deterrence. I mean, that's, that's, that's why we come together. It's a defensive organisation, contrary to allegations by President Putin. It is, uh, and that you, you know, you provide defence through deterrence. Um, and if th this conflict doesn't overspill, if uh, Putin, uh, you know, for all the words, uh, doesn't escalate. Uh, and if anything does happen, we are in a position where we can provide that resilience uh, uh, and reassurance to our, our fellow members. And that's absolutely what works for NATO. Um, but, you know, I, yeah, I mean, that's ultimately what we're there for. We are a self-defense organization, and, and anyone who claims otherwise is, is wrong. So. There's lots of talk about expansion. Uh, you sort of semi-referenced it in an earlier answer. Um, how could NATO expand at the moment without giving President Putin an excuse to take action somewhere else or to demonstrate to his support, whatever it is, I told you so all along? Um, it seems that NATO is likely to expand very soon, isn't it? Well, NATO is never going to expand into Russia. So, um, you know, I mean, I mean, it, it is, uh, it, it's quite interesting. Um, 
I think I've lost count of the number of international statements signed up by Minister Lavrov uh, uh, or indeed Putin on um, the right to respect a nation's freedom to join an alliance. I mean, I, uh, funnily enough, when I went to Moscow, uh, having seen how Lavrov played games with uh, Liz Trust, I, I made sure I read in detail their so-called draft uh, treaty. I then looked at, compiled all the times Lavrov or Putin had declared that we respect a nation's right to choose an alliance, and that goes back to, I think, 1991, 1989, you've got Istanbul, we've got declarations, Istana declarations, you've got declaration after declaration where the Russians put their name to it. I remember George Robertson telling me that, you know, at one stage he'd, he'd they'd put out this thing and Putin put his name to it. So, um, just because the country is small doesn't mean to say Putin gets to pick and choose when his declarations and Lavrov's uh, come into force. So, uh, I, I think the reality is that. If President Putin wants to make an excuse to do things, he's already proven he'll make it up. I mean, you know, he's, he's already made up that apparently the Nazi hordes of the Ukrainians were about to come and invade Russia. I mean, he's, he, he's made it up. He's announced it again today. He's talked about it again today. So and I, do I think if, if Sweden and Finland join NATO, it'll be provocative? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, he was told. I mean, 2014, he was warned, you do this, you know, the consequence of invading Crimea is more spending on defence and more NATO. And that's exactly what he got. Uh, no, one, no one hid that. Very, very clear. Um, you know, that's why the EFPs are in you know, Estonia, in Poland. It was very clear. We warned it publicly. Uh, everyone talked about it. I said it in, in Moscow that if you, if you do these things, you'll get more NATO. So he can't be surprised. Um, and uh, the reality of it is he makes his strategic blunders more than he makes the strategic successes. You know, like yeah, it still doesn't sound like many off ramps, though, out of this crisis. I mean, this seems to be, and this was mentioned this morning by our first panel, we seem to be in a position where, where there is almost doubling down by, 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 by every party to this terrible conflict at the, at the moment, um, you know, except, except for the four civilians um, who are there. NATO is doing it to reinforce its deterrent posture. But, but the question is, how will we get out of this crisis? I mean, you must find it a bit dizzying. Well, I'll ask you, is it dizzying? Uh, the latest thing at the weekend was that um, there was some speculation that uh, there might even be a referendum in Switzerland about, about NATO membership. Um, this is quite extraordinary in, yeah. in, in a matter of months. Mind you, there's a referendum about everything in Switzerland. That's right. Look, look, I, um, you know, I, I generally hold very true to the tenant that effectively people choose NATO, NATO doesn't choose it. And NATO is not some country that goes around the world trying to absorb things. It, it is, it, it, it is, a, it is an organisation of people with the same values who believe in self-defence, uh, you know, not offence. And um, uh, look, choosing off-ramps, there may be lots of off-ramps. I mean, we've already seen President Putin shaping today, potentially, a sense of about the Donbass and, you know, I'm here to defend the Donbass and defend our people in the Donbass. Um, and he may, he's certainly capable of writing uh, a story that fits his narrative, uh, if he wishes to do so. Um, but, you know, the world can't stand by and watch him invade sovereign nations, commit war crimes, well, his forces are committing alleged war crimes, uh, and go around bullying the world and not expect us to stand by our values. You know, freedom isn't free. I mean, that's the motto above the South Korean War Memorial. Um, and, uh, you know, let's put it another way. At the moment, there are a number of supposed battle-winning components that you would expect a successful army to have. Technology, leadership, intelligence, support of the population. Well, he's wrong on all those four, right? So it turns out that the Ukrainians don't want to welcome him with flowers and banners. Um, turns out that his superior technical forces, the way they're deployed, don't work. Uh, they're not as necessarily superior in some areas as they would led to the belief. His intelligence was clearly wrong in many areas, and the his judgment of the international community was wrong. There is one component he still has in his back pocket, which we should really worry about, which is brutality, which is if you win your war by killing, murdering, raping, bombing civilian territories, uh, breaching all human rights, all Geneva Conventions, corruption, and that becomes the battle-winning component, 
the message that sends around the world to other adversaries is incredibly dangerous. That you don't actually need to have all the best kit, all the best training, or, or appropriate rule of law. You just need to be able to be more brutal than the other person and, and, and more prepared to destroy everything in your path. Now, that's been said in, you know, generals and philosophers have said those for decades. That is still the untested component, you know. They're not interested in occupying Mariupol, they've destroyed it. I mean, they will use it, they will use the port, but they've hardly invested in something to save there. Um, and where we see it, it it's, you know, it's, it's, it's destruction. So, so I think that is a really important thing. It's why it matters to the international community, and it should matter, that if Putin is successful in Ukraine, then watch out. Okay, I mean, I, I don't want to get, I don't want to fall into the, the narrative of, of, of Putin about this being uh, Russia versus versus NATO. But just before I move on to implications for Britain, um, NATO as an organisation, um, its leading nation, not very long ago, had a president who was questioning its relevance and its future. Um, that, that person, those views, could easily be part of the next election in America. Um, European allies continue to question the role of NATO uh, in European defense as compared to other security and defense uh, structures, as you know and as you will discuss. I just go back to this question of how far this, and we're trying to look about at the future as well, how far the defense of Europe and ultimately the NATO's role in it will be affected by this crisis. Uh, are, are, we, are we already seeing that some of those quest difficult questions about, about the relevance of NATO are now essentially being put to bed? Well, I mean, I, I remember when President Trump was, was, you know, the president. I remember the December NATO Leaders Summit and having lunch with him and a few others of us had lunch. And, you know, actually my reading of President Trump's questions on NATO was more about a view of are we in the United States taken for granted by other members of NATO who aren't paying their way uh, as opposed to anything else. It was, it, you know, President Trump was always about money. It was about money, right? So, you know, he'd be saying I'm putting in, I know, X percent, three billion or whatever it is, you know, billions and billions into NATO. And these countries are getting, uh, you know, a free ride as he would view it. Um, and I think, you know, the 2% club, you know, wanting to get people to, to pay more for their security. I don't think that's unreasonable. And I think, actually, I'm off to Washington after this. I mean, I, you know, I, that, that's heard across the aisle. You know, there is a sense of how much is the U Europe going to put in the pot uh, to help contribute to its collective defence. I, I think that's perfectly reasonable um, that, you know, many countries, including the UK, have all taken peace dividends over the last 30 years. Um, and be very quick to bank in the end of the Cold War, but not necessarily step up when the security got going. So I, I, I don't, you know, I don't think that was him actually fundamentally saying he doesn't believe in the collective self-defence or anything else. I think it was a, a sense of, you know, I did an interview saying taking for granted. What I meant was, you know, I think America, you know, we, we in Europe must not take America's support for granted. We must recognise that you know, they, they spend a lot of money to do it. Um, and, you know, what I would say is this incident has jolted a lot of countries to come forward with planning incre mm -hmm. spending increases to actually spend, spend their way back into it. Uh, and also, you know, the, the point about, you know, other European nations, well, you know, it's Sweden and Finland that seem to be, you know, Big European, I mean, not in scale, but very respected European members of the EU who the first point of call is actually, I think, maybe we'll explore NATO. It's not European Union thingy, which is always developing. I mean, as long as I've been around, it's been developing into some form of strategic compass or whatever it's calling itself. And, and, and I think what's been interesting in this position is when it comes to security, people do trust that Britain does what it says. You know, um, it does come and stand by you. We might not have everything to do it with. We don't have past divisions to do it with. And I know a lot of my colleagues and everyone would like us to have more, but, but we do We do turn up. You know, we are there on day one. Um, in fact, in Ukraine, we were there on day, well, how many years ago? 2015, we did or orbital. Um, we were there on the ground. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got a squadron and tanks in Finland right now. So we do. And I think that 
something to be proud of. So let, 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 let's uh, turn to Britain then. Um, the papers are full of a, of a cost of living crisis. Um, you're talking about increased spending by some members of NATO. Um, is the UK going to spend some more on defence? It's going to be a difficult ask, isn't it? Uh, the public don't actually link, even though we may intellectually link it, do the public link the cost of living crisis with the, with the crisis in Ukraine? Not entirely. Um, you know, how are you going to get the resources that you need to encourage your colleagues in NATO and, and other forums well, to support you? I, I think at the time we got the 24 billion extra, we were the first to have a big jump. And you know, the Prime Minister was very supportive. It was the biggest, I think, single jump since the Cold War. Uh, and uh, it was very important at the time when the threat was what it was to make sure that we, you know, modernise the army. I mean, the army's land fleet is woefully behind its peers. Uh, uh, and you can lay the blame, all sorts of reasons, but fundamentally it's, it, it's, it needs definitely to modernise. Uh, we needed to take some strategic decisions on, you know, type of complex weapon systems uh, and, and all sorts of things uh, were incredibly important. And we did get that funding for it. And as I sit here right now, uh, we've got the extra funding for operations, you know, to support Ukraine and our, our lethal aid that, that we've been doing. That was in the media over the weekend, the 1.3 billion. Um, and uh, we will continue to be able to meet the current commitments. Of course, and I said it all the way through the process, as a threat change, we should also be prepared to change. I don't think it's impossible to persuade the public of the importance of stability. I mean, the one thing I bring from being the security minister is, you know, the world is a very fragile place, right? It, it is, I remember the Home Office was very clever at making its case to the Treasury for more money. After, after a, a terrorist attack, the Treasury would manage to always present sort of economic consequences. You know, this, this terrorist attack here cost the economy 1.4 billion. It, will, it would show how much it costs to prosecute a terrorist. It would show that loss of business to, let's say, central London when a terrorist event happens is X, and make the economic case to the Treasury that you want to invest in counterterrorism because the consequence of not is this. And I think it is, it is possible to persuade both inside government the importance of security uh, and, and that food security, energy security, it's all in there, uh, uh, um, uh, matters. Um, and I think, you know, if I go back to the 1980s and things like that, you know, the public perception of where defence fitted was much higher. Uh, I don't think that's impossible to turn that round. Mm. I think you just have to have a concerted campaign to tell people the importance of defence. I mean, you'll know in your world, you're try constantly trying to make it relevant to people why you need to understand defence. And um, I think it's a really important, it is a really important <laughs> issue, but, but nothing's for nothing. You know, there are a number of distinguished um, writers about British defence policy and de British defence reviews over the years. You oversaw uh, the defence component to the integrated review. Um, and one of the things these, many of these authors have always written is that the one thing defence secretaries have to avoid is saying anything too big, lest it be proved wrong. Um, the integrated review did a tilt to the Indo-Pacific, and we end up with a crisis in Europe. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's a law of defence reviews that, it, that if, you, if you do anything new, it may not appear to be the right thing. As, as you look back on, on the review and as you th think about the next step, um, how well do you think the review is standing up? Um, um, I'm sure you'll say it's doing very well. But I suppose looking forward six to 12 months, do you see a need for, for what, what the uh, Tony Blair administration had to do after their well-received review of 1998, where they had to have a new chapter to the, to the Street Defence Review? Um, I know you're not going to say there's going to be a massive change, but, but do you feel, in terms of reviewing our, our posture and our approach, we're pretty well set at the moment, or will there have to be a look in the, in the coming year, let's say? Well, I, I, I think you've slightly mischaracterised the... Uh integrated review, because the Pacific tilt was not just about defence. It was about culture and science and, you know, British, uh, you know, engagement uh, culturally around the world. It wasn't just about, you know, it wasn't like we're going to send aircraft carriers every week to, to, to the Pacific Ocean. And it also clearly identified Russia as our number one adversary. It also identified NATO as the cornerstone of the security of Europe. So, so I think those were uh, absolutely uh, true. Uh, I, I think, for what it's worth, that the, the mistakes of the past uh, of defence reviews have been, A, that the appetite of number 10s, let's call it that, was never matched by the budget. Uh, and defence MODs either tried to 
uh, accommodate the ambition without telling them the price tag. Uh, and in some cases, some of those defence reviews were funded by rather fictional, what looked like efficiency savings uh, and targets that were never really true. But, but then the department spent those savings before they'd had them. I mean, I think the, the defence review before the one I did, where the George Osborne's one, I think, it, I think it planned 11 billion pounds of efficiencies, of which the department was allowed to spend 13 billion. You know, it was that plus some, a small amount of new money. And um, you know, if you say to any department, in theory, you've got it, you have to keep really tight hands on the purse string. And then if you then get ambition from number 10 or foreign office or whatever, you have to be a bit of a, I'm a bit belligerent by nature uh, to people to say no. And if, it, you know, it, I think defense is a, is a department where it can very quickly run away from you. If you are not careful, it can become very expensive very quickly. Uh, and you do have to spend some of your time fighting your corner to either say no to one department or no to somebody else because you know there is it, it can get very quick uh, very expensive and, and so i think you have to have your hand on that tiller i think historically senior leaderships in mod talked about the need to run the budget hot uh, which, which 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 it sounds like you're moving away from that so in other words uh, having natural overspend yeah I, well I, I think you have to, this year i'm going to come in on budget i think it's the first time in 30 40 years so um uh you, you have to. Uh, well, you've got to also see the long and the short term. I mean, the Treasury doesn't like seeing long term. It finds it particularly difficult. Um, you have to be quite tough with the the armed services about make your mind up. You know, what are we going to put on this new ship you're you're about you're building right now? Because if you don't make your decisions now, let me tell you, the bill will be much higher later. And and you know, we have that all the time. Um, so you just have to be rather sometimes pedantic about it. But, uh, but you also have to remind people of the ambition. You have to say, if you want to do more, that's fine, but it's going to cost you more. Um, so the, the Air Force and the Navy were seen to be the winners in the last review. Is, is it the Army's turn now? Or, or let me put it a different way. Can you see um, a, 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 a move back to perhaps a slightly larger army? In, 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 well, the army got five point two billion pounds in investment in new equipment. Which no, I mean numbers. Sorry, not not, not well, spending. Yeah, but but um, Go ahead. Um, you know the, the winners and losers in the review. What I would say is, I think we're now in a place where our funding cycle slightly matches the cycle of the three services. That's part Stratcom, even though Defence Digital is one of the biggest spending of the lot. Um, is that you know the RAF are in a cycle where you know its investments. You know, ty the Typhoon upgrades, um, the F 35s coming online, P 8s, E 7s. They're slightly, you know, their cycle is in the right place. Um, the Navy, Type 26, Type 32, Dreadnought, the next generation of attack submarine, um, they're all in a place where some of those decisions have been made and it's now in their sort of delivery cycle. And the Army was the one that was woeful behind. So if you, if you look over the sort of 10 years of the Defense Command paper, some of the army stuff was brought forward because the gaps in them was, was too much. I mean, gaps in land EW, gaps in armoured vehicles, uh, all of those were, were too, too high risk to tolerate and, and we should never have, you know, they got where they were. We needed to fix that. Um, so I think they're in the right place. Uh, the size of the army, um, I, th I think it's quite interesting, you know, People are already spending the money that we may or may not get one day, right? I mean, I, I'm getting you know, lobbied for more tanks or more precision weapons or more deep fires, and um, that's constant. Um, and um, depending on usually what stable the person comes from, it is often uh, linked. I don't know. I mean, if I got some new money, would I suddenly treble the size of the infantry? I'm not sure. I mean, if you look, the lessons from Ukraine are showing real impacts on how you might fight a future war. So the lack of counter UAV is something that we should all worry about, really worry about. Now, if you buy a whole lot of UAV batteries, they'll not be huge human intense resource. There'll be lots of capital there. Uh, so you're focused on the effect rather than counting ships uh, and, yeah, uh, and, uh, and yes. numbers. But you can't deploy a division. Well, in a well when do, OK, OK. Let, I was in one of these divisions in North Germany, right? I mean, it usually turned out to be about a brigade and a half. Uh, and, and in fact, when we last deployed a division, it was two brigades and a commando brigade, I think, in the Second Gulf War. So, so uh, the thing I really wanted in that command paper 
is to do what it says on the tin. Now, people might not like me for that, but we get lots of top Trump collectors, you know, look at all these Type 45s. Yeah, well, none of them work, or well, three of them work, the rest are tied up and have been for years. You know, what is the point in boasting you've got so many units if they're not properly wrapped, as I'd call it? And, and what you're seeing on the road to Kyiv is Russian forces that can stack up on parades, but if they don't have the proper comms, the proper protective armour uh, uh, measures to protect them from the proliferation of handheld anti-tank, they can't uh, integrate with air, they can't communicate because their comms are so rubbish they get exploited, uh, they run out of fuel, the soldiers don't have any situation awareness. We've even found examples of downed SU-34s with GPS things stuck to the dashboard, or cockpit, we call it in an airplane. So you can boast, you can line them all up, say how wonderful they all look, like the T-14, which we're still waiting to appear. I, th I think when you were in the army, I, I, I recall lots of uh, officers telling me that they used to use mobile phones. Yeah, uh, I mean, it worked better. I remember the, the, uh, the early nickname for Bowman was better off with Map and Nokia. That's right. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I mean so, so whatever people say, and they may not like the defence command, but I'm sure they don't if they said we wanted more tanks, whatever, because I want it to say, do what it says on the tin, rather than these big hollow forces that we've all served in. Now, we can argue about they were under-resourced all along, isn't that, that's just, that should have been fixed, and that's probably right, right? I mean, you know, I, I served in those places. Um, uh, I remember we never had a laser rangefinder on the Warrior. We had lots of Warriors, but no laser rangefinders. So every round you ever fired was discarded, because you have a first round discard. I remember on my Rangers qualifying for firing 30 millimeter, I probably paid for a laser rangefinder every time I missed. But, you know, no one made those decisions. So uh, I don't want hollow forces. Hollow forces don't deliver anything. So it sounds like you, you are focused on not overcommitting to things that Britain couldn't deliver. I guess my last question is, as, we, as we approach, um, well, as we come to the end of the session, is how far are we making an assessment about what uh, peer, let's say, peer competitors might be taking from this crisis? So as we look to the broader defense of Europe and, and not just Russia, um, are there any implications that you're seeing that we need to think about seriously, which could have implications for spending as well? Yeah, I mean, and, and actually, even before this, um, I think the last time I was up at King's College was going to see a war gaming, um, is that, you know, we've set up SONAC, which is a net assessment centre for us. We just appointed Dr. Johnson as our, as our, our lead, which I'm delighted about. Um, we absolutely need to incorporate sort of red teaming, war gaming, understanding uh, our own vulnerabilities and you know, really ask the difficult questions of ourselves and our armed services about the decisions they're making. I think that's, that is the most important thing. I think you know, if, uh, if Minister Shoigu had had a SONAC um, and uh, it was up and, up and running, some of his, their assumptions may well have uh, been tested correctly. Um, and I think it is really important that we keep this as an ongoing process. I mean, if, if, if I am successful in making the department truly threat-led, um, then part of informing what that threat is will be informing of our own vulnerabilities, and therefore things like net assessment centres, things like academics, and that, you know, academia telling me that it, I've got it wrong or got it right or where we need to invest more money into R&D, and it's over 6.6 .6 billion into R&D, so we get to see it to make some, also some risk decisions. Because, you know, um, the one thing I'd say about my own service, it is the most conservative of them all, the army. And, you know, letting go of certain capabilities to invest in others is sometimes quite hard. It's hard for the innovative generals who want to, to change something. It's quite difficult. And you're only going to do that if you invest in R&D. But then having invested in the R&D, you actually incorporate it into your military. I mean, many of us in this room would have gone to experimental days and Salisbury Plain and seen, seen for years robot, robots and UAVs, and, and you say, OK, so where is it? Well, come back next year and you'll see the same thing going around in circles. So we have to sometimes take some leaps. So is Britain leading that debate? I mean, that's the last sort of semi-question to, to this. Well, we, you know, the United States gets to lead a lot of that debate because it has such vast forces that it can take risk in one part while, while holding on to the you know, holding on to yesterday's battles with another. I mean, it's allowed, it gets that choice. We, we as a smaller partner, always will have to either follow their, their, their learning or take some risk. Now, sometimes we do, and we do it very well. Um, and, 
uh, I think that's, that's what we've got to get politically comfortable with. It's also what, what many in armchairs have to get politically comfortable with, that, you know, if, if I'm always trying to defend against yesterday's war, then how much will we move forward as an armed forces unilaterally? Now, I can do that. I don't mind being unpopular. But, uh, um, you know, we, we, it is a risk because who knows? And, and that is the challenge of defence security. Secretary of State, thank you very much indeed for fielding my questions. Thank you all.